Well, thank, can you hear me? No? Yes? Thank you for coming. Um, hopefully with the time change, your tummies aren't growling too much, but we'll have, I'm sure there's lots of food after this. Um, so I'm really pleased to see all these people turn out to learn more about women's issues regarding epilepsy. When I first started almost 20 years ago, one of the heads of my department um, said, oh, what's your interest? And I told him women's issues. He's like, is that even a thing? I said, yes, it's a thing. And obviously, we've done a lot to educate people on, on these topics. Um, and obviously, it's important to you. I'd like to talk, I want to take, leave a lot of time for questions, but I do want to go over four main issues. Would you prefer me to stand? Is that better? Or, yeah, is that better? Okay. I'm just going to, I like to lean, so I'll lean on this. How's that? Okay. So um, I'd like to talk about four things. Um, one is pregnancy, and that always comes up. Two is hormones and seizures that are associated with um, hormones. I'd like to talk about birth control so that you can plan a pregnancy properly. And then finally, I'd like to uh, just speak a little bit about vitamin D and bone health. So, so those are the main things that are important to women with uh, epilepsy. So the first one is pregnancy. Can I have a baby? Is it safe to have a baby? And the answer is yes. So you can have a baby, but you need to plan more than someone else. Other people are like, oops, I'm pregnant, you know. No, no, no. <laughs> and unfortunately, the um, unplanned pregnancy rate in the U.S. is about 50 percent, but online surveys of persons with epilepsy, that number is higher for unplanned pregnancies. And it may be because the medications are interfering with your birth control. It could be that you may have memory issues because of the epilepsy or from the medications. And then if you're inconsistent with your birth control, there can be an unplanned pregnancy. So I want to empower everyone here that a normal pregnancy can happen, but it does take planning. So one is that we do know which medications are safer. So you can all go on to the website, <coughs> pardon me, um, the North American Anti-Epileptic Drug Registry. So it's based out of the Mass General, and since 1997 they've been enrolling pregnancies, and they find that there's fairly low birth defect rates with Lamotrigine and um, Levetiracetam. The brand names, if people need to know, uh, Lamictal or um, Keppra. So those two are probably have the lowest, although we're getting more and more data for things like zanisamide and, that, and gabapentin. So those also have fairly low birth defect rates. All of the other ones are kind of in, in the middle. So tapiramate has a birth defect rate of almost 5%. Um, and then the ones that are to be avoided, if all possible, are valproate or depakote, depakine, and then um, the uh, phenobarbital, okay? And one medication is, taking only one medication is better than taking multiple medications, okay? You can have a, a, a perfectly healthy baby with multiple medications, but we try to limit that, okay? So um, that's with pregnancy. Now, you do have to um, think about if you're going to breastfeed or not. So th most of the medications does, do get into the breast milk, but we see low levels transfer to the baby. Um, and so my rule of thumb is if the baby is too sleepy um, and not feeding well, then maybe you switch over to formula or a mix. Okay. The other thing is um, safety. So baby, you know, if you're having frequent seizures, we actually um, recommend um, having a changing table with a strap. So if you, baby is being changed, you have a seizure, baby's safe. And even as with, with your epilepsy, no standing water. So if you're going to wash baby, do it with a washcloth. Um, if you're going to do the bath, make sure that there's someone with you. So if you have a seizure, baby doesn't drown. So just some kind of common sense things. Um, 
but uh, so being on the safest medication that you can and at the lowest dose is, is um, preferable. Then um, moving on to hormones. Anyone feel that their seizures are worse with hormonal changes? Yeah, so you, you're being validated right now. This is a true thing, okay? So we do know that estrogen is pro-seizure in the brain. It increases connections. And actually, progesterone is anti-seizure. It actually calms down. Um, it boosts a, a neurochemical called GABA, and it calms down um, brain activity. So estrogen is pro-seizure. Progesterone is anti-seizure. And so women's hormones are on a roller coaster every month. And so at mid-cycle, there's a peak in estrogen. And that, if you are sensitive to that, you may have seizures at mid-cycle. The other time is one or two, day, one or two days around menses when you start um, your period. That is a withdrawal from the progesterone. So if pregnancy doesn't happen, hormones come down, and that can trigger a seizure. So if you think that you have that pattern, you should be keeping a calendar so that you can go over it with your doctor or with your gynecologist to see what options you can have uh, to treat that. So um, that will lead us into birth control. So birth control can help those seizures. So instead of going up and down on hormones, you can have continuous hormones for the month. The problem is that many seizure medications can be affected by, uh, uh, many seizure medications can affect the hormones. Um, and so, and one in particular, lamotrigine, is actually affected by the um, hormones. So if you're on lamotrigine and you add birth control, lamotrigine levels go down. So you do have to be wary of that. On the other hand, mo many seizure medications will make birth control ineffective. So if you're on um, low, low estrin, the low, low mean is pertaining to the amount of hormones. So low, low has less than low estrin. And so you may need the higher content for it to work for you. Um, so many women with epilepsy, if they want um, birth control but don't want it to be a problem with their medications, they may go for an IUD or use other barrier methods, condoms, things like that. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about bone health. You definitely should be checking your vitamin D. So some of the older medications can chew up the vitamin D. So what they do is they rev up your liver. And you know if they, they chew up other medications, you've probably heard of that. Well, the same thing. It chews up your internal vitamin D hormones. So please get that checked. Um, and what I recently found out talking to some of my colleagues, my psychiatrist colleagues, is that low vitamin D can actually contribute to anxiety. And anxiety and depression go hand in hand with epilepsy. So for sure, that's something natural that you should be um, checking. And then long term is to have, you know, strong bones. We don't want to have seizures fall and have um, a fracture. So those are the four things I'd like to talk about or kind of touched upon. Why don't we take some questions from the audience? Yes. Um, I have heard that vitamin D3, and if it's very low, there is a prescription one that's 50,000 units to boost you. You know who is very adept in supplementing people is your primary care doctor. They are all over this low vitamin D issue. And um, what they'll do is a weekly 50,000 units, and then, you know, you should, the, I believe um, it's 400 International units is the, is the usual daily one, but persons with epilepsy, if you're on some medications that may um, predispose you to low vitamin D, you may need 1,000, you may need 2,000 a day. So um, 
be sure to get that checked with your primary care doctor if your neurologist isn't um, checking that. Yes? Mm. Right. So, you know, the hormones definitely uh, play a part. So persons with epilepsy, um, if you have the hormonal, hormonally triggered epilepsy, sometimes that actually gets better during pregnancy because the hormones are kind of stable. But pregnancy in of itself, those, the, your hormones are the highest they're going to be in your lifetime, that estrogen. So it's probably, um, an estrogen is pro-convulsant. So it, it strengthens neural networks. And so um, I've had, uh, I'm sure she, she won't mind, I, I take care of a, a doctor actually who has only had one seizure in her life and it was postpartum and actually on the day postpartum. So the other thing is that progesterone withdrawal. So if it happens immediately after birth, many times it is that progesterone withdrawal. And then she got an MRI and she, they found some scarring and, and she's so funny. She's like, ha ha, I fooled everybody. I have this scar, but I'm a doctor. And it was only until after she had the seizure and someone imaged her. So, um, so, the, so if there is a very tight link between um, that big hormonal change, I would assume that it is um, a, a, a factor for sure. But then what can you do about that? So I validated everyone here that they've seen this and we've done research showing that um, seizures, the highest likelihood for a seizure is the first day of menses, plus or minus a day. That's the most common pattern as well. And then mid-cycle. So some women will go on continuous birth control, as I said. Um, others I have worked with and used um, natural progesterone. So if they have regular cycles, using some right before menses to kind of ease that transition. Um, and then also mid-cycle. Because on the other hand, you do need to be working with a GYN because, you know, is it safe for you to be on hormonal therapy? What's your family history of breast cancer and all of those things? Yes. Okay, so the question was, uh, what's my experience with epilepsy and hysterectomy? So we have had some women, you know, get hysterectomies. The thing is that the hysterectomy is not going to take away the ovaries, which are are producing the estrogen, um, which can be uh, one of the triggers. And so the what happens is the estrogen goes high and then you make a, the corpus luteum on the ovary which produces the progesterone and that is what is fluctuating not so much the uterus so um, we don't recommend getting a hysterectomy just if you have catamenial epilepsy meaning seizures triggered by the hormones. Now you can look forward to menopause because then menopause, you know, we will not have those that, that fluctuation. Um, it's a plus minus whether or not you're going to go on, not you in particular, but anyone go on um, supplemental hormones because again, that's another time that you're introducing hormones which can be pro-seizure. Um, I have had persons who post-postpartum, uh, post, post-menopause, actually the seizures have gotten much better. You've probably talked to some of your friends who they've had migraines and the migraines have gotten much better. It's, it's fairly similar, right? Both these conditions are episodic, neurologically based, and so um, once you take that hormonal factor out, it should be better. Yes. So she's, um, the question is, it's a, a young girl who is, uh, has epilepsy and is nearing um, puberty. So exactly. So um, we have seen girls who go th are well controlled and then things go haywire with um, 
puberty, especially because in the beginning, the um, periods are very irregular. So the hormones are quite off. There can be a lot of anovulatory cycles, so it's high estrogen with no progesterone. And um, seizures that were more mild can actually be stronger. Oh, with with um, her periods, and oh, exactly. So um, it, I would definitely keep a calendar once she does starts having um, menstruation, or if they're getting worse, that could be um, a time to maybe you know bring in the pediatrician or endocrinologist to see what's going on with the hormones. But those definitely, you know, um, puberty, pregnancy, and then menopause are all big hormonal transitions in a woman's life, and um, they, it does play a factor in their epilepsy. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. I just finished my progesterone and I'm starting to struggle. They don't seem to have a problem when I'm just taking the estrogen, which is pretty decent. Right, but it's steady. It's keeping it stabilized. It's keeping it stabilized. And so, um, you know, so when you, uh, you know, you've had estrogen your whole life, right? You've, so your brain is not... Um, naive to, to estrogen, but it's just giving it at a more steady state. So when you were perimenopausal, you were having some anovulatory cycles, which were very high with no matching progesterone. And so every cycle, there used to be kind of this match of estrogen and the progesterone as your body's trying to get rid of those last few eggs, you know, you're having big hormonal fluctuations. So now the you know gyn has just overrided your natural with a low dose estrogen your body's not working so hard and it just you know balances it out the problem is is that you know is the pro, is the progesterone so you go off the estrogen or it's just yeah, no months, they want the yeah 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 Mm hmm Yeah. So you'll need to talk to them about, you know, is there a different way to do that? Can you get both estrogen and progesterone or, you know, at the same time or, you know, yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because we're learning more and more about autoimmune issues and epilepsy and inflammation in epilepsy. And of course, women are more prone to autoimmune um, conditions. So it is something, if someone has new onset epilepsy, um, you know, that's very difficult to control. One of the things that we do check now is, is this an autoimmune condition? So again, it's revving up your immune system, right? So, I mean, that's why some people, you know, it, there, there is a link with neurological conditions and uh, injections. So I usually persons with epilepsy do get the flu shot, you know, um, so it's, 
it's what we're learning is there are some specific um, autoimmune conditions. So lupus does predispose to seizures. Um, when people have something, a uh, teratoma, um, they, their body can make antibodies to that teratoma, which is a tumor in their ovary, which then crosses and um, attacks the brain. You may have uh, heard of the book Brain on Fire. And so that's a, you know, an autoimmune epilepsy or actually an autoimmune encephalitis. So can we say for sure that that, that link? Probably not, but epilepsy researchers are very interested in the immune system and um, brain link. But we're also very interested in how our um, gut biome is affecting our brains. So, you know, we're learning more that the ketogenic diet we thought was working on a cellular level in the brain, but it's probably working in the gut and changing our gut flora and then boosting the neurochemicals in our brain that way. Brain on fire. So it is an anti-NMDA receptor antibody that attacks the brain. And it's a movie now? Yes. And it's on Netflix. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does she have epilepsy? Absolutely. Okay, um, for sure. So, um, you know, there are many people in this room who will say, I get migraines before my seizures, I get them after my, my seizures. Again, they are episodic um, uh, neurological events which the hormones can trigger. So, if she's getting migraines around that time, you can talk to you know the pediatrician her gyn um, she might be a little young for that but um, i would definitely look into that is she having more seizures around that time usually starts with one and then it's a week-long migraine oh seizure and then a week-long migraine so the, obviously it's a it, you know a, a hormonal trigger um, I, but I'm going to segue into genetics. So genetics is the next big thing in epilepsy. Um, so there, you know, many times your doctor and, and myself included, we say, I don't know why you have epilepsy, you know. But now um, we are testing, usually children get tested right away. And I see mostly adults, right? And so, um, you know, when do you test adults? So I have been testing persons when they are not fully controlled. Like, why are we not controlling these seizures? You know, we're usually thinking about, you know, surgical options or device options. And me being the scientist and being very curious, I'm like, what could we be missing? And so um, we're finding that many times there's a gene abnormality and these gene abnormalities um, affect a certain, um, you know, uh, channel in the in the cell membrane and make it more excitable and so that where is where it would predispose you more to seizures versus epilepsy that's where that connection is when you have a problem uh, in the cell membrane making a, a uh, that problem so um, you may want to talk with your doctor about genetic testing and see where, what what Especially if you're thinking about having children, you may, it may be important to know what's your chance of passing it on to your, your offspring. There's usually, in the, in the past, we have quoted 10 to 14 percent because, if, again, if there's no known reason, but now we have more data and you may want to um, get a genetic test. They've become much more um, reasonable in price um, and, um, uh, you know, it's a little blood work or spit and probably half of you have already done, myself included, Ancestry.com or, you know, I have not done 23andMe because, uh, 
I don't want to know my dementia risk, but <laughs> the neurologist, ignorance is bliss. So, <laughs> um, but again, so you may not want to know your genes. Um, again, this is a very limited panel. So we're not testing for dementia and all of that. We're just testing for the um, 150 or so genes that have been associated with epilepsy. Now, do I have patients with who I know have epilepsy and I've done that testing and it's negative? We don't, again, we just don't know the genes. Um, the two patients that I'm thinking of both have a genetic type of epilepsy. They have juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, but the gene genetic testing came back negative. So again, we just don't know everything. But it may be helpful if you have, if it is positive, it may be helpful for your physician to know what medications might be better. Again, if it's affecting the sodium channel, you may not want, you shouldn't be on a medication that, you know, affects sodium channels. Other questions? Yes. So if you have more than one type of epilepsy, is that genetic? So there is a, a good, there is a likelihood that it is genetic. There is something called um, generalized epilepsy febrile seizure plus syndrome, abbreviated GEF syndrome, where you have both uh, generalized seizures and complex partial seizures. And that is clearly, exactly. And that is definitely genetic. Um, and what we're finding is different genes. Um, mm hmm Yes. Yes. So, and there can be new mutations. So, for sure. So, there can be, you know, it, it can express itself differently. Any other questions? Yes, Ashley. Uh, with anxiety and? Vitamin D, yes. So, um, low vitamin D can increase anxiety. So you uh, definitely need to check vitamin D and supplement. And you know, uh, many patients will say, oh, it's another pill. I'm already taking so many pills. I don't want to take another one. And, um, but if you have low vitamin D, um, you know, definitely under 20, you should be taking supplements. So um, yes. Well, the other thing that you should get checked is definitely your B12. So um, if your level is less than 400, you should definitely be supplementing your B12. Now, when it's important that you write that number down because your primary care doctor is going to say, oh, your level's 350, it's fine, because the lab says that it has to be low like 250. But as the neurologist, we know that there can be neurological consequences below 400. So um, the nice thing is, and uh, now we have sublingual B12. So in the old days, you know, if you had a problem absorbing it, you had to get the shots and you had to find someone to give you the shots. But now I supplement B12 with sublingual all the time, which is very helpful. Yes. I love magnesium. Um, so I, at LA County Hospital, I run a high-risk OB clinic, and um, we use magnesium all the time for migraines in pregnancy. And um, I, I think it's very helpful, especially in epilepsy, where we have these channel um, problems in the cells. What magnesium does is um, it works on NMDA receptors. So it has a brain target and can calm things down. So I, the, my two go-tos are first magnesium, 400 milligrams twice a day, and then B2. And so um, B2 is also known as riboflavin, and it's, um, you know, you can start as low as 50 or 100 per day. The maximum is 200 twice a day. 
We lost some people, but hopefully they got their answers. <laughs> Anything else? So the studies were done at pretty high doses of 200 milligrams twice a day. And then there's some studies showing efficacy or benefits as low as 50 milligrams a day. So I might recommend 100 milligrams a day to start and then work up. And you'll know pretty quickly if, if it's helpful. Because it works pretty, it, it, because it works pretty fast. The mag so the magnesium, the only kind of limiting factor with the magnesium is diarrhea. Is, yeah. So, you know, the, the pregnant women are like, bring it on. <laughs> and so, um, so that is many times the rate limiting factor um, for the magnesium. Whatever is going to get absorbed and, you know, I mean, it's interesting because the migraine, you know, I've been doing this whole magnesium for migraines during pregnancy for a long time, and now the headache doctors are doing infusions of magnesium. So if you've been to a, magnes uh, to a headache center, they'll do monthly infusions. Yeah. Uh, one of my colleagues does. I don't do Botox. I don't do the infusions. But... I can set you up with someone who does. Yes. So too much of certain supplements obviously can be bad. Too much B6 can cause a neuropathy. So again, heavy metals are, you know, I'm not familiar particularly with that one, but I usually prescribe magnesium and B2 pretty liberally. Yeah. B6, too much B6 can cause neuropathy. So, but, yes. Well, some, well, some people, exactly. So a lot of people will take the magnesium at night. There's a new powder that says calm. I've had patients bring that in. <laughs> and so, it's just, yes, the calm. I'm like, oh, I love it. I've looked at that, that. You can't take it during the day. I mean, you know, again, oh, oh, yeah, you can take it during the day. I mean, it's just going to, it depends on how it affects you, right? I mean, you know, you could be a lightweight, and, I, you know, I respect that. And, and people like, I have, uh, you know, there's this, like, lavender tea that, like, puts me out, right? And so... Uh, I can't drink that during the day, but, um, you know, I think it's, again, I respect people's tolerance to different things because I think it's your genetic makeup. And I think that, you know, here's the one time I think psychiatrists are ahead of the neurologist, because usually they steal all our medications, right? But they um, are, are doing more and more of that genomic testing to see how you metabolize the different SSRIs, the different um, medications. Um, well, you know, I, I ha did have one patient that I tried to order it on and the insurance um, denied it, but I don't know if that's because I was a neurologist ordering it and, you know, psychiatrists have, uh, you know, a better... Yeah, I th Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. So I think the genes w are going to, you know, be very helpful both for epilepsy and on the psychiatric side, um, figuring out, you know, that one is geared more towards what's your liver makeup and so how do you metabolize or chew up those medications. The epilepsy genetics is more what's going on on a cellular level, what is messed up in the cell membrane that makes your neurons too hyperexcitable. Yes. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay, so which of these 
Well, I don't do the 23 and me. <laughs> so the polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, thank you for bringing that, that up. Um, so that too is a, a hormonal um, issue that sometimes the seizure medications can make worse. And there are certain types of epilepsy that predispose to polycystic ovarian syndrome. So there is a, the generalized epilepsy um, does predispose to the polycystic ovarian because of all of those discharges affecting the pituitary. So if, if it is running in the family, the epilepsy is running in the family, I would definitely look into the genetic um, panel, not 23andMe or Ancestry. Um, again, I don't get paid by this company. I use Invite only because uh, it's called Invite because it, just similar to this other woman, they will work with you and, and make it a few hundred dollars if your insurance doesn't cover it. Um, your doctor, exactly. The other one that I know of is um, Gene DX. So again, I, I'm not trying to promote anyone, anyone in particular, but both of those companies have a, a Gene panel. So um, you know, again, it could, I like I said, it could be negative, so it may not have the answer, but it has been very helpful when it is positive. I've been crystal clear, really? It's been helpful? You got your, your answers that you were looking for? Good. All right. Yes? Um, what about um, would there be any sense or different smell trigger I, you know, peep, for sure, you know, there's patients uh, with migraine are definitely much more sensitive to smells. Um, but, you know, there is um, all different types of triggers. You know, there's someone that Mariah Carey singing triggered their seizure, you know. <laughs> so there's something called reflex epilepsy. So, you know. <laughs> exactly. So just as, you know, flickering lights, you don't need a, a strobe light, right? Even flickering lights through trees can trigger epilepsy. You don't need the Pokemon show. My daughter gets it from lights and smells in the house. Mm-hmm. She has some photos. Yeah. So there was a smoke test, I guess they do through your air conditioning to make sure that it's working properly. Yeah. Apparently the air conditioning works properly. Okay. Yeah. So again, persons with um, reflex epilepsy are going to be sensitive to those stimuli. There's a question over here. Yes. So my daughter does the same thing with her eyes. Um, fluttering. She's the same way that she's got a smoke thing. Uh-huh. So I would definitely, um, if you have uncontrolled epilepsy, you should be at a level four epilepsy center, right? So what a level four epilepsy center is, they can offer all forms of control and testing. So including the genetic testing like we're talking about, they can do video EEG monitoring, they can do dietary therapy. So I have patients who have had that type of epilepsy and were not controlled on anything but the um, Atkins diet for epilepsy. And um, change their life. So don't give up because good. Don't don't record this.